The Bible says about Abraham, this man that very famous in world history. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. I want to ask the question this morning on Friend Day, how can a human being become a friend of God? That's exactly what God called Abraham. When the Bible says that in the New Testament, it is actually quoting a passage in the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And to understand what the Bible meant when it said, Abraham believed God, and God counted that to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God, I need to understand what happened in Genesis. So I want to invite everyone to open with me to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Why was this human being called a friend of God? Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. So the very front of the Bible, the very first book of the Bible, is the book Genesis Genesis chapter 12, and before I read this, I just want to make note of the fact that according to Scripture, there is such a thing as a human being who is the friend of God. Look at what Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, your family, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Notice the next sentence, or excuse me, this one after that, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So here you have a man who's lived all his life. He's 75 years old. And God says to him, I want you to do something. I want you to get up, Abram, and I want you to leave everything you've ever known, everything you've ever been. And I want you to get up, and I want you to follow me. Bible says in verse 5, Abram took Sarai, his wife, and his brother's son, Lot, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. So all of a sudden, I have a guy named Abram. He's living his normal life, and God says to him, Abram, I want you to pick up. I want you to leave everything you've ever known, and I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. Now go with me to Genesis 15 now, move forward just three chapters, Genesis 15 in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, or but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless? God, you said if I would get up and follow you, you were going to give me more descendants than I could possibly count. But here I am. I have no child. What will you do for me, God? Notice in verse 3, Abram says again to God, you have given me no offspring, and all I have is a guy who works in my house as my heir. And the Bible says down in verse 5 that God brought Abram outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then here comes the line. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram came to a point in his life, but by the way, the word believe in the Bible is a word in the Hebrew language that means to be persuaded. He was persuaded, 
that what God said he would do. And the moment that he was persuaded of this, the Bible says that God looked at Abram's heart and said, that is righteousness. I count that as righteousness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I in my lifetime and you in your lifetime, anyone in this room is ever going to become the friend of God, you first are going to have to believe him. You're going to have to believe that what he said he will do. The Bible says in James, I quoted you when we began, that Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of of God. Now, I want to take you to one more passage that explains this story a little more. You're in the New Testament in Genesis. Now I want you to go almost to the end of the Old, the, excuse me, the Old Testament, you were in Genesis. Now go almost to the end of the New Testament to the letter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11. If you're not sure where that is, you can check the table of contents in the front of your Bible under New Testament, the letter to the Hebrews, H-E-B-R-E-W-S. Hebrews chapter 11, notice verse 8. By faith, that's the same word as believe, because he was persuaded, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please remind me, how old was Abram when God came to him and said, I want you to leave everything you've ever known, everything you've ever been, and I want you to follow me. How old was he? 75. He was 75. Sometimes there are people who say, listen, man, I've lived all my life a certain way. I have a dear friend in the center of the city. She's attended a number of services here. Retired archaeology professor from Yale. We've had many interesting conversations. And yet she has said to me on a number of occasions, as we've explained, both the Old and the New Covenant, my husband has already died, and I know what you're saying, and I think it's true, but i it's too late for me now. Ladies and gentlemen, Abram was 75 years of age. And at that day in his life, God said to him, I'm telling you, this is what I'm going to do. And what has to happen at that point when God speaks, it gets mixed with your persuasion. You actually get up, leave, and follow him. The Bible says in verse 8, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah, his wife, herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age. Why? Because she considered him faithful who had promise. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore, go down to verse 15. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to every one of us here this morning that God wants to be your friend. But very similar to what he did in Abram's life, there's going to come a time in your life when you are going to hear what God said. Even when I was explaining right now about the new covenant. Even when I'm getting ready to explain. And when that happens, no matter how old you are, no matter what you've done up to this point, you will have the opportunity to be persuaded about what God has said, leave what you have done, and follow him. Now, According to Scripture, if you're going to be a friend of God, this is going to have to happen in your life. You are going to have to believe Him. You're going to have to take Him at His word, be persuaded, and forsake how you have previously lived. You must be so persuaded of God 
that you will leave everything to follow him. The Bible tells us a story. For example, I'm going to share a few of them. We are, the first book of the New Testament is called Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish man who was an adult who was working. He was a very covetous type of person. He took a job at that time 2,000 years ago that made him uh, very disrespected in his culture. The Jewish people had uh, become slaves of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, in order to pay for their government all around the world, would exact taxes of all the citizens. It's like the British did when they were here. The Roman Empire did that in Israel. They didn't have enough. They could not take all the Italians and take them all over their empire to have them run their jobs for them. So they hired Jewish people in Israel to be the tax collectors. Can you imagine how you would feel about your buddy? Let's say you're, you and your good buddy Mike here, Doug. You guys grew up together since you were five years old. And all of a sudden, Mike becomes the tax collector for the Roman Empire. I don't think you'd like Mike too much for doing that, betraying you. People in that culture didn't like, here you are, you and I went to school together, you knew me. And now you're knocking on my door and you're demanding that I pay taxes to pay the Roman government or you'll throw me in jail, and both of us are being occupied by them. The tax collectors were also hated, not just because they collected taxes, but they were notorious because here's what would happen. The Roman Empire would announce the tax rate, but the tax collectors, because they had the power of the army behind them, would double the rate. So if it was 10%, they'll charge you 20, and you better like paying it. Or we'll throw you in jail or worse. So if you're a tax collector, you have absolutely no, the only thing that means anything to you is money. And you'll betray anybody. That's Matthew. The Bible says one day Matthew was sitting in his tax booth and Jesus walked right up to his tax booth and said, follow me. And the Bible says Matthew, sitting in his tax booth, left the booth right then and he followed Jesus. Guys, do you know half the New Testament is written by a man named Paul? Do you know Paul had lived halfway into his adult life as an Orthodox Jew? If there was anyone who was an opponent of the New Covenant, it was him. In fact, the Apostle Paul, if he were standing here this morning, I've had people say this to me at other times, don't you know where I came from? Don't you know where I've been trained? Don't you know my background? And the Apostle Paul would say, like he did in the New Testament, if anyone has reason to have confidence in the flesh, I have more. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. He said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. That's the strictest order of the Jews. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. If you want to stack up your background, let's do it. But then he said, whatever things I had gained, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count all things as lost. All of my background, all of my job titles, everything the world will be impressed by. I'm a member of this club. I lead this organization. Paul says, I count all that as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul lost his standing in society. He lost a lot of friends. He lost his job. And Paul said, I gladly trade all that in because Christ is worth more. I have suffered the loss of all things. And he said, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law me doing good works, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a question for you. Do you want God's righteousness, or are you going to stick with yours? There came a time in the Apostle Paul's life, there was no one who tried to be more righteous than him. But he said, when I met Christ Jesus, I abandoned everything I had followed to that point, and I followed him. This is what Abram did. 
this is what Matthew did, this is what Paul did, and I'm telling you this morning, this is what every single Christian has done. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant of fine pearls. So we got a wonderful jeweler in our room with us here this morning, Ann. You know what the Bible says, Ann? The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Do you know you will really understand who Christ is when you're willing to leave everything and follow him? I want to ask you a question. Has that ever happened in your life? Can you imagine that, Ian? Your son finds a jewel somewhere in the world. He says, Mom, we got to sell the entire store. We've got to buy this one jewel. The Bible says that's what the kingdom of heaven's like. When a person comes to Jesus, they get everything they were and had. They trade it all for it. How does a human being become a friend of God? They must come to a place like Abram where they believe God and they leave and they follow him. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says in the New Testament, do you not know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Why? What is it that's wrong with the world? The Bible says the world in which you and I live, by the way, the word world that's translated in English is a Greek word named cosmos, and the Greek word means an arranged system. You and I have been born into a system that is arranged against God. For example, listen to Mark chapter 4, verse 19. God, Jesus said in Mark 4, 19, that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes out to sow in a field, and he sows the seed, and he describes one kind of ground that it falls in is, is thorny ground. And Jesus said, what are those thorns? Mark 4, verse 19, they are the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things, and they choke that seed and it proves unfruitful. Guys, the world that you and I live in has its own cares, its own desires, the pursuit of riches, so that a person's life is so busy pursuing other things, they never hear the call of God to abandon what they've been and follow him because they're so wrapped up in the cares of this world. That's why the Bible says, do not love the world or the things. And by the way, when he says that, he means the system of the world's desires and pursuits. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of your flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world system lies in the power of the evil one. This morning as I declare the word, I'm speaking to all of us who live in this world. A system that has been arranged in its desires, in its focus, in its pursuits, in its cares, to have nothing to do with God. And yet in this world, God comes to human beings and says, I want you to follow me. And you have an opportunity. You're going to stay in that booth and keep being who you've been. And say, I've lived all my life. i got a comfortable world. I'm happy with the way my life is. And God says, I want to be your friend. I want you to believe me. And I want you to follow me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that God loves the people that are in the world and has sent Christ to rescue us from its darkness. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus said in John 12 and verse 46, I have come as light into the world so that they may not remain in darkness. You know, the Bible says that, listen to what the New Testament Paul one time wrote. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world. The world has a course, it's on everybody. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. And listen how, listen how the world controls you. Listen what the Bible says. In the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the body and mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, like Abram. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's been big news lately in the news. Almost everyone has heard about the recent conversion of Kanye West. I saw an interview with him the other day. This guy does a late night show. James Cord is on an airplane with Kanye West. On the airplane, he says to Kanye West, what are you going to say, Kanye, to all these people who say to you, I don't believe it. I saw this guy two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, five, four years ago, he says to Kanye West. I don't think this happens night and day like it's happening to you. And Kanye West said to James Corden, he said on the airplane, he said, when you're asleep, would you agree that we're asleep? And the guy said, yes. And Kanye said to him, when, when we're awake, would you agree that you're awake? And the guy said, yes. And Kanye said, would you say those are two different states? One guy's asleep and one guy's awake. And the guy said, yes. And Kanye said, the people who don't believe are asleep. They're walking dead. And then Kanye said, this is the awakening. I woke up. I wonder if that's ever happened in your life. You're just going along through life. You're following the desires of your body and mind like everybody else is. You're running right down the track. And all of a sudden, at the age of 75 or 15 or 90, God steps into your life and says, I want you to leave everything, and I want you to follow me. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're ever going to be a friend of God, you're going to have to take that step. The Bible says, in this, the love of God was made manifest to us that God sent his only son into the world that we might not remain in darkness. This is the love of God, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That's the word I told you about at the old, at the old tabernacle when they would cover the, the lid with the blood. That's propitiate. He sent his son to be the sacrifice that covers our sins. And John said, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. I'm going to ask everyone this morning, are you willing to leave the world in your heart, its desires, its pursuits, and get up and follow Jesus? To become a friend of God, you must abandon the world in your heart and transfer your complete trust to Christ. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs, leave your simple ways and live. The Bible says in Acts 20 verse 21, repent toward God. You acknowledge to God, God, I have followed the desires of my flesh, the body and mind. And I repent of this and put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is what the scripture calls us to do. 
The Apostle Paul said in Galatians, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 6.14 says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There came a day when I heard God's voice, and he said, I want you to leave. And that was the last day in my heart that I was there. I left. That's Abraham. That's Matthew. That's Paul. That's every genuine Christian. The Bible says, whatever has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I believe God. I am persuaded that what he has said he will do. So persuaded, I'll leave everything I believe before, and I'll follow it. Someone once said, there will be no peace between you and Christ, while there is still peace between you and your sin. You and your sin must separate, or you and your God will never come together. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to be a friend of God? There's only one way. You've got to go through Jesus. And that means you leave your old covenant way of doing things. That means you acknowledge, Lord, I've lived my whole life caught up in the world system. And I believe that you sent Jesus so I would not remain in that darkness. And like Kanye West, I'm awake. Bible says where God lives in heaven, you ought to read Revelation 21. It describes exactly what heaven's like, but it says at the end of that chapter, there will never enter into heaven, heaven anything unclean, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You will never know God or live in his presence if you will not get up from where you've been in your heart, leave it and place all your trust in Jesus. I'm telling you, that's what the scripture says. In conclusion, the Bible tells us this. Psalm 25, verse 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. The person who says, Lord, I hear what you're saying, and I am persuaded of you, and I am going to follow you. I fear you above all else. The Bible says that's who God's friendship is reserved for. And to that person, he makes them know his covenant. What is his covenant? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, this is the covenant. I will write my law in their minds and on their hearts, and I will be their God and they will be my people, and they will no longer teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Who is the person that knows God like a friend? It's the one who's willing to abandon his own righteousness, his sins, everything he's believed before. And like Abraham, and like Matthew, and like Paul, and like millions of others. Scripture says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Would you like to become the friend of God? Forsake the way you have lived. Believe in Christ and follow him. Right. Lord, I'm thankful for your word that tells us that everybody in this room can become a friend of God, but like the people we heard about today, we have got to be willing to forsake what we have trusted in and how we have lived and wake up and follow Jesus. 
Lord, I pray if there's anyone among us this morning that that is the need of their life, that this will be the day in their life, just like there was a day in Abraham's life, a day in Matthew's life, a day in Paul's life. Lord, I ask you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank everyone for being here today. And I would like to say this for any of you that are here this morning. You say, boy, I heard some things I never really understood before. What I would encourage you to do is return again. Hear the scripture again. There have been many occasions after the morning service, people have come up to me and said, you know, I want to, I want to act on this right now. What do I need to do?